Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation, episode 74, recorded October 17th, 2012. David O. Triangulation is brought to you by Stamps.com. Use Stamps.com to buy and print real U.S. postage the instant you need it right from your desk. For our special offer, visit Stamps.com, click the microphone, and enter Triangulation. And by Ford. Featuring available Ford Sync. Now you can control your media player with simple voice commands. Enjoy your drive while you easily search and listen to your favorite songs. Check Sync out on the 2012 Ford Focus or at Ford.com. Technology. It's time for Triangulation, the show where we get to talk to the most interesting people doing the most interesting things, big thinkers. And uh, we've got a great big thinker for you today on Triangulation. People sometimes say, why do you call it Triangulation? Well, originally it was me, Tom Merritt, and our guests, so there were three sides to that triangle. But now it's just me and the guest, and the third side of the triangle is you at home. So we have... Uh, more than a thousand people watching the show live, and uh, many of them in our in our chat room. And uh, this is going to be a great one for you to ask questions because I know you are all very interested in the Mars Curiosity uh, mission. We, in fact, covered the landing of Curiosity live on the Twit Network, and I, I'll never forget. I was at home watching while Tom and uh, uh, the crew did that live coverage, and it, I really got excited because I realized that. Yeah, mainstream media, media was covering it a little bit. CNN, you know, was covering it a little bit. Then they went away to something else. But our audience was so engaged, so fascinated, so excited about what was going on. I realized that uh, this is something that's important to us and something that we want to do a lot more of. And so today we've got the lead flight director for the Curiosity mission. David O is joining us. Uh, the Curiosity, of course, is the Mars Science Lab that is currently wandering around the Red Planet. David, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Leo. Great, it's a pleasure. Great to have you uh, here. So let me let me ask you about a little about uh, your background. Are you an engineer? What's your background? Uh, my background is I am an engineer. I'm an MIT graduate. Graduated with a PhD from there in 1996. Um, I have an engineering degree. I also have a music degree. I have an undergraduate degree in music from MIT also from 1991. Awesome. What kind yeah. of music? Uh, I did a lot of singing. I uh, did a lot of choral music, classical music, and uh, I'm a tenor. People don't really think of MIT as a place for choral music. <laughs> uh, actually, it had a pretty, it had a quite a strong music program when I wow. when I was there. And the director of the MIT choir was also the director of the Tanglewood Festival Choir. For wow. anybody who's familiar with that, oh, yeah, so, Tanglewood's wonderful. Yeah, it was a great, yeah, it was a great experience. So that that there does seem to always have been a nexus between engineers, scientists, programmers, and musicians. It's I guess the same side of the brain or something. I think that there is. Uh, there were a lot of musicians at MIT, a lot of performers, even though there weren't so many majors because it was a technical school. And I actually know three people who worked in rock music and then uh, became rocket scientists at JPL or other places. So it's more common than you'd think. Gives, gives new meaning to the word rocket. I know Richard Feynman liked to play his bongos, but I don't think he was a serious musician <laughs> but I, I think there's a mat music music is mathematical uh ultimately um yeah and i don't i won't say that i understand why there's so much so many musicians have the technical background but there's a certain yeah. set of relationships there and a certain creativity also also i think that goes with it so what what was your phd in was it in space uh, it was in space. It was in uh, plasma thrusters. So I was a rocket scientist. I still am a Literal, rocket scientist. Literally. <laughs> Absolutely. Wait a minute. You can get a doctorate in plasma thrusters? It's in aeronautics, astronautical engineering. Uh, what I, I studied was, uh, was what are called Hall effect thrusters. It's a type of plasma thruster. Was that your thesis? It was my thesis. Are, do they use plasma thrusters now or is that something futuristic? Is that Star Trek technology? Uh, at the time, they weren't used very often, but now they're used all the time. Uh, the, the 70s 
satellites that carry direct TV and Sirius satellite radio, they all use these uh, plasma thrusters, ion thrusters and hall thrusters. There are over 200 spacecraft in wow. orbit that use these thrusters. So normally thrusters are rocket fuel, like the, like the boosters that launched Curiosity. But a plasma thruster is what, charged, charged matter? Uh, yeah, so it's a form of what we call electric propulsion. And what we do is instead of using heat from chemicals to drive the rocket, you use electricity and you ionize particles, charge them up, and then you can oh. accelerate them using electricity. More, more efficient? It, it's much, much more efficient. Uh, in terms of efficiency, it's like five, six, seven times more efficient in rocket fuel. You use a lot less fuel when you do it that way. But you don't get as much thrust, so you've got to be willing to take your uh. time to get it's for it's for people who aren't in a big hurry, <laughs> like right, like Sirius Satellite. They're not. They're, they're, <laughs> we'll get there eventually. Eventually, we'll get there. So let's see. Ninety six. So that means that you were born after uh, Neil Armstrong uh, walked and Buzz Aldrin walked on the moon. You didn't get to see that growing up. Did you? Did you follow space as a kid though? Did you watch later Apollo launches, things like that? Well, let me correct you. I was actually born, I think, four months before Neil Armstrong. Oh, right then. The yeah. So, so I, I think I did watch it, but I don't remember it. And <laughs> I did watch space growing up. I remember the Viking landings on Mars. Yeah. I remember the Apollo Soyuz mission. I remember yeah. the first flight of the space shuttle. Um, I remember Voyager when it went to see uh, Neptune and when it went to see Uranus. Yeah, it was all part of my, my upbringing. Was no that, did that inspire you? Did you think then that you wanted to be a rocket scientist? I think it was always something that I wanted to do. When I went to college, I wasn't sure exactly what I was going to do. Um, but when I was choosing what I would major in, I definitely went back to all these things that I'd seen and the excitement of space. And I was yeah. part of the Star Wars generation. You know, I remember right. seeing that movie. I talk to scientists a lot who say science fiction heavily influenced not only their uh, excitement about science, but actually about sometimes about the stuff they studied and, and did work on. Yeah, I think it really did influence where I ended up going. But I wasn't someone who was just gung-ho space from the very beginning. It wasn't until I got to college that yeah. I started looking around and saying, well, what can I do with this, with an engineering degree? What would be fun to do? Right. Rocket science looks good. <laughs> Did you want to become an astronaut? Did you want to be somebody who would go on a manned mission? No, I didn't. Uh, you, you can't tell from the screen, but I'm actually too short to be an astronaut. So uh, I always wanted to work more on the engineering side, building things, building robots. Building a Mars rover, I think, has been on my list for a long time. That's been a, a, on the list of things I want to do for forever. So uh, tell me when your, your involvement with uh, uh, Curiosity began. I got involved with the Curiosity rover and really with the Mars program six years ago, almost seven years ago now, uh, when they were just finishing up their preliminary design and have been working on it ever since. I was working, I was one of the lead and systems engineers for their electronics and their power systems. So I had a team of people who were delivering computers and power and telecommunications to the rover. Uh, and it's been an, a a big journey over six years getting it to the surface of Mars. That's so cool. How did you become the lead flight director? That sounds like the that sounds like a pretty important job. <laughs> um, well, I actually did not come straight to JPL. So I worked for seven years on communication satellites up there in Northern California. In oh, Palo Alto, Space Systems Laurel. Okay. And then I uh, I'm finishing my ninth year at JPL. So it's a combination of experience and then the time I spent working on the Mars rover. I guess they liked me enough to make me lead flight director. That must have been pretty. Fun. That must have been an exciting day when they said, "Hey, David, how'd you like to run this thing?" Yeah, it was, that wasn't a bad. <laughs> that wasn't a bad day at all. That was a good day. And yet, there's got to be some pressure. You know, when I first heard about how you were going to land Curiosity, I really thought there's no way they can do that. <laughs> and you weren't able to test it, were you? We were never able to completely test the landing system because the gravity on Earth is three times heavier than the gravity on Mars. So we can't run the landing system. We'd always crash every time on Earth. So we tested it in pieces. We did simulations. Uh, we you know, counted on data taken in the 70s on parachutes and did wind tunnel tests. We did everything we could, but we could never test it end to end. And we weren't sure that it was going to work on landing day. It was definitely not a sure thing. So I was really glad to get that thing landed on the surface of Mars. I, I, I think we could tell that because... Uh, we were all glued to JPL during this landing. We watched with such interest. It was so compelling. And you could, I, I, I hate to say it, but I could see you guys 
a sweating a little bit, right? And the relief when, uh, as stage by stage, things went well was absolutely palpable. Yeah, it was pure joy when we landed that thing. I bet. And, and you know, the guy, Alan Chen, who's the guy who's reading out all the events as right. they happened, he'd been working on the Curiosity rover for 10 years of his career. Holy So cow. it was all on the line right there. 10 years of work on the line. And you did... <laughs> you, you, you probably don't want to answer it, but how, how confident were you this was going to work? <laughs> um, I will say I wasn't 100% confident, but I will say that I was confident that we had done everything that we could right. and that we had the best people on the planet working on it. So you, you reach a point, uh, at least I did, where I said, well, I've done everything I can and it's time to sit back and let this happen and, you know, We'll eat our peanuts and we'll say our prayers and we'll see if we have a good day or not. We all ate yeah. peanuts, by the way. I just want you to know that there were, th- there were plenty of people uh, here on watching our network, watching the NASA feed, talking about it and eating peanuts with you guys <laughs> going, come on, baby, come on. You know, we got a thank you note from the National Peanut Council two weeks later. <laughs> you sold a lot of peanuts. <laughs> I, I didn't even know there was a National Peanut Council. So uh, th- there's something I learned from this mission. I think I tweeted, is it okay to eat peanut butter? Because that's all I got. Uh, <laughs> so, but when, when they told you, okay, so here's the idea. We're going to hover a platform. Well, there's a pro- I guess first you have a problem. How do we land this without stirring up so much dust that the thing is useless? That's right. So what was proposed? I know the previous mission, I loved it. You bounced that ball. That was crazy enough. That was, uh, yeah, I would say that. And actually, it was kind of funny to hear people, they look at the sky crane, as we called it, yeah. with a big rocket pack and lowering the thing down. And they'd be like, well, that looks dangerous. Why don't you do it the way you did it last time? And when you kind of step back and you go, well, the last time we took a whole bunch of airbags and blew it up and bounced it on the surface. <laughs> You know, starting from scratch, would you really say that that's a more reasonable way to land? You kind of get used to it after a while. It's funny what people get used to, right? right? Oh, we did it like that last time. It must be. It must, it must be. It safe. worked. <laughs> it worked, right? Well, it looked just as crazy the first time they did it in 1996. I agree 100%. Yeah. Um, so who was it that came up with the idea of, okay, we will uh, – in fact, we, we had – for our coverage, we had an interview with Steve Sell, who, of course – was responsible for that sky crane. Was it Steve's idea to do that? Who came up with that one? Uh, I don't actually know the the person who came up with it. Um, I think there's a team of people yeah. who worked on it hard. And, and it's one of these things where in its initial conception on the back of a napkin, it looks kind of crazy. But when you think about it and you go, sense. well, would you really rather have the rockets on the bottom? Right. Or on the top. Actually, right. you'd really rather have the rockets on the top. Right. And everything else kind of drops out naturally from that if you work your way through the math and all the different options that you got. So it's, uh, it's, it looks crazy, but it is really the product of great engineers doing their best to come up with the, the best way to land. Well, and it just it makes, uh, makes engineering uh, rock stars. It makes you – it makes – it's like these guys – are the coolest guys on the planet because they dream- they not only dreamed it up, they figured out the equations, they never got to test it, and they had the confidence to say, you know, this will work and do it. And it did! <laughs> Absolutely, it, it did. It worked! And I think some of the pleasure of seeing it work was the sense that it might not work, right? Oh, absolutely. It was it was an absolute load off my shoulders to see that thing on the ground. It was just a tremendous... Wait, I think, for all of us to watch it and go, is this going to land? Is it going to land? But it did. And so now we can be happy and maybe someday we'll get to do it again. So it's, it's a, a good day. Let's talk about curiosity. It's the size of a Volkswagen. Right. Is that or the is... biggest thing we've ever landed on a, on a foreign body? Uh, it's bigger than the Apollo, right? Uh, I don't think it's bigger than the the Apollo landers. Those are pretty those are big. big. You're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. um, we we didn't have to carry a person. Right. But we went a lot farther. We went 150 million miles. Eight months. Um, yeah. It weighs a ton. It's certainly the biggest rover we've ever put down, and it's it's kind of the size of a Volkswagen. I'd say when you've got all the arms and appendages and the head out, it's more the size of a Jeep, a small SUV. <laughs> it's uh, really quite quite a thing there and it has 10 scientific instruments on it 
It has two scientific laboratories built into it where they took laboratories that would take a whole room on Earth and put them down into boxes the size of a backpack and packed them in there. Amazing. And it's got a uh, drill. It's got laser. It's got high-definition video cameras. It's got uh, all sorts of stuff on it. Great stuff. Incredibly sophisticated. Uh, and, now, but it's, it, now, and it's an interesting challenge because it's 14 minutes after you give a command that it receives it. So it, does it, is it mostly autonomous? I, it does. It actually has to do most of its work effectively autonomously. Um, we, on surface operate, well, first of all, when it landed, it had to do everything by itself because it's only seven minutes from the top of the atmosphere to the ground, and we're 14 light minutes away, so we can't do anything to help it. It's got to do it all by itself. And then when it's on the surface, we don't talk to it all the time. We actually normally talk to it. We send orders to it only once per day. And then it goes off and does its thing and reports back to us at the end of the day. We look at what it did over the course of the Martian night. And then we come back and give it another set of orders the next day. So mostly it does its work autonomously. The software that's controlling it, how sophisticated is that? I mean, is it... Uh, you? You have effectively power PC processors on there. Uh, yes, we have a RAD 750, which is derived from a power PC. It is a much slower processor than you would see. It's uh, in the 120, 130 megahertz clock range, which is to say 10 times slower than the processor in my iPhone. Right. So it's a lot slower. Uh, it's got four gigabytes of RAM. It's very sophisticated software. Um, what do they write that in? Is it C++? Is it... It's actually written in C. C. It's written in straight C. Straight C. Yeah, they not even... Ada, not some special NASA programming language. Just C. No, it's not even object oriented. It's just straight, straight C. I kind of like that actually. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's good. <laughs> and do programming down at the bit level. I mean, all the right. all the drivers that are used on it are custom written for it. All you know, down to the drivers that do communication and talk to instruments and run serial buses. All of that stuff is custom, so that we is, know what it does. Is that because it's so all the hardware is so unique, or is it why is it that it's all custom written? You, you... It is. It is unique hardware. Um, we use some standard serial buses and stuff like that, but we use them with our own protocols. And the hardware is all built at JPL in the United States. Uh, the, the processors, not the processor we get from outside, but many of the electrical boards, um, all of the the parts that are machined are machined in, in Pastina. Interesting. It's really something that's made entirely in it's the United custom. States. Totally custom. It's largely custom. Yeah. That is. So that's why you have to write custom software. That makes a lot of sense. And we're trying to do a lot with it um, in a relatively, compared to like an iPhone, a relatively uh, not powerful processor. Right. And we have to make it super reliable because it has to be able to recover on its own. So it's, it's not like the software that's running in a Mac or a PC. It's very different. Well, and all software has bugs, but you can't afford really to have a, you can't crash the computer. Uh, yes and no. I mean, we, you, we actually deal with the fact that it's, that the, computer may crash and we build in as build in as much as possible redundancy so that the system can recover the system actually has two computers on it there was one running primary and there was another running backup ah. and there was uh some software running on the backup backup that would try and take over if the main computer crashed uh while we were trying to land on mars but again it wasn't a sure thing i think we were a lot happier to go down on the main processor yeah not and swap in the middle no um, and have there been crashes? Have you had to press the reset button at all, or has it been pretty reliable? Uh, we have had resets that happened. We had resets that happened when we first uh, launched it, um, that we we uncovered some bugs that were deep, deep down in the hardware oh, wow. that we fixed on the way to Mars. So that kind of stuff happens. I think this is also part of the mythos of, of JPL, of NASA, of these kinds of missions, is the, is the MacGyver-like ingenuity. Uh, that you, you, you know, it's, it's, you only got what you got and you got to figure out ways to solve problems that you may not have anticipated, or you have to anticipate as many as you can. And yet things happen. Right. And a lot of the challenge comes from the, uh, the time limits we work with, because you can only launch to Mars at certain points in time. Right. 
So if you have a, a hard deadline and the deadline isn't something that some manager told you, the deadline is set by the alignment of the planets. So you're either going to make that deadline or you're going to miss by two years. Oh, and really? Is that how, that's how the window is every two years or something like that? That's right. There's Holy a 30 day window every two years. That's it. That's it. <laughs> oh, wow. That doesn't give you a lot of uh, – you can't slip the ship. You have to get it out there. Well, now it is true, in fairness, that the rover was originally supposed to launch in 2009. Okay. And, and after looking at how difficult it was, uh, we decided, you know, it, we need to wait longer. So right. we pushed it two more years right. um, so we could land safely, which we did. And the, di so. and the, bi the bit rate of the connection is what, 500 kilobits per sec? What is the bit rate between you and the uh, Bit rate's a funny concept. So when you're on the surface of Mars, um, you – don't actually talk directly to the rover. The rover doesn't talk directly to us most of the time. It talks to a satellite that's in orbit right. around Mars. Right. And that goes back to us at Earth. The peak data rate is around 2 megabits per second, which is a little faster than T1 line. That's pretty good, yeah. But you can only talk to it for a few minutes a day. Oh. So <laughs> we get about, on average, 400 megabits a day, which is, say, 50 megabytes a day down from the rover and that so like at home i have a dsl line it does six megabits per second it's the equivalent of every day i get to go on the web and use my dsl line for one minute <laughs> and then it turns off and then the rest of the day i'm just working off that one minute worth of data i got that 50 megabytes to try and decide what i'm going to send to it for the <laughs> next day and the next day i send it and i get another minute's worth of data to look at it and then come back so it's it's not that much um, but it's enough. You've got to be very patient to be a space scientist, obviously. You do have to be patient. Yeah. And, and we're also very strict in prioritizing what things are coming down when. And, right. and there's a whole protocol for making sure the most important things come down first. Is um, most of that 50 megabytes telemetry, images? In terms of data volume, a lot of it is images. But the first things that come down are always telemetry. Right. Because we always want to make sure the rover's safe and sound right. and that things happen like they were supposed to. And then we start getting scientific data and images. The images take up just a lot of the bandwidth because they're so big. Um, and, it, and you can take um, – there are pictures that are still on board the rover. There are pictures that we've taken that will probably never come down. What? Because they're on the cameras and we just don't have the bandwidth to bring them down. So we have to make intelligent decisions about which pictures to bring down and which ones not oh, to. Oh, wow. I had no idea. So there's a backlog of data. Yeah, there's a backlog of data. Um, the cameras each have – there are four cameras that have eight gigabytes of memory uh, built into each one of them. So there's lots of memory there to store images and it will download like thumbnails to us and we'll go through and decide which ones are the ah, good ones down and things like that. That makes sense. Yeah. Right. You use Lightroom, you go through it, you say this one, this one, this one. Do you, yeah. do you Are you planning, come on, you're admit it, you're planning a manned mission to get the, uh, the, the compact flash card from the camera at that a later would, date. That would be very cool. <laughs> I would love that, and that may happen. We're talking to David O. Uh, it is such a thrill to talk to you, David, and we're, and we're so excited about what you're doing. I have so many questions, my own and the chat rooms, that we're going to ask some more in just a bit. Uh, I also want to talk about Living on Mars time, because I know you and your family uh, did that. I think that's kind of a cool idea. Your son has his own blog all about living on Mars time. We'll talk more about that in a second. Our show today brought to you by Stamps.com. Uh, so I think for some people, going to the post office is a little bit like a trip to Mars. Something you kind of, you know, <laughs> you know, you can put it off. You might want to. That's why I love Stamps.com. You could do it all from your desk using magic, the magic of the Internet. Uh, Stamps.com lets you print official U.S. postage with your computer, your printer, whenever you need it, on demand. They even give you a great USB scale so you never need, you know, spend more on postage than you need to. You always know exactly how much. It's always up to date. You don't have to worry about a change in prices. Uh, you don't need a postage meter. You don't need special ink. You just need Stamps.com. And it's really designed to integrate with your workflow. If you do a lot of mailing, uh, you use QuickBooks to do invoices or other mailings, it'll take the address is from your QuickBooks address book. Print them right on the envelope along with the postage, your company's logo, whatever you want. Same thing, eBay, Etsy, Amazon, um, it, it, PayPal. It will take 
the data from the web page. You don't have to cut and paste. It just does it all automatically. If you do international mailing, you'll love stamps.com. It fills out the forms for you. And the beauty is you never have to get up and go to the post office. The mail carrier comes to you. You can even schedule free pickups and takes your stuff, takes your forms, and you're good to go. This, the, the post office loves stamps.com. It, it gets you out of the lines at the post office and uh, makes them more efficient. In fact, that's why they give you discounts you cannot get at the post office. 21% on express mail, 15% on priority mail, and there's discounts on uh, international mailing as well. Look, find out more. Just go to stamps.com. Now, you see right there on the front page of stamps.com a special $80 offer. You might say, that's great, $25 free postage. I get the scale, the supply kit, the trial. No, I could do better. Click the Hear About Us on the radio or podcast. Click that microphone right there. And then enter our offer code, which is triangulation. That's the name of the show, triangulation. Press go. And now that $80 offer magically transmogrifies into a $110 bonus offer, $55 in free postage. You still get the digital scale, the supply kit, the four-week trial. Stamps.com. Try it right now. $55 in free postage. That's pretty good incentive to give it a try. Stamps.com. Please use our offer code. Triangulation. Oh, what a... F this is really a, a fun uh, interview for me because I've been... A, I, I grew up watching Walter Cronkite as the je through Mercury, through Gemini, through Apollo. I always wanted to be an astronaut. Uh, and we, we got the next best thing. David O., lead flight director of the Curiosity... Mars uh, Space Laboratory mission that you perhaps saw just a few months ago land on Mars. Curiosity's wandering around. Are you getting the kind of data that you were hoping for, David? I think we're getting great stuff. We're getting great pictures, and the pictures are they're stunning, are wonderful. Um, and we're starting to do some real science now, so I think that's great stuff. We loaded uh, sand into the one of the chemical laboratories on board last night, so we'll get to see. The results of our analysis today that'll be good stuff how did this work is it is it um uh like the hubble where different scientists all over the world apply and say i want my experiment i want my data how how does that work it's kind of like that but it's all done on a much faster schedule so we have hundreds of scientists who are working on this right now but every day we have to come up with a plan for what the rover is going to do next. So the scientists meet in groups by themselves, and then we all come together into a big science meeting, and then they meet with the engineers every day and decide what's going to happen next, and then they kind of vote on it, work it through, get a consensus on what's going to happen, and then we go on to the next step. So, yeah, the scientists have a lot going into it, but each instrument, and there are 10 instruments, has its own little group of scientists working with it, deciding what they want to do. NASA has been, uh, um, and JPL has been fantastic lately in terms of how they do outreach. The great videos we've seen on YouTube, the Twitter account, Curiosity is tweeting. Is that, a, who, is, who is that, by the way? Is that a single person? or? There are a couple people in our outreach office that specialize in social media. It's and I've great. got to say that they've done a great job. Yeah, because it really grabs people's imagination. How much of the science you do is influenced by that? I mean, part of your mission really... I mean, nobody wants to, to say that. You're pure scientists, but it is also to get the hearts and minds of the American public behind you so that you can continue to do this kind of stuff. No, I think that's really important. And I think it's been really great how the social media folks um, have engaged. I don't mean our social media folks. I mean everybody out in the Internet. Because like you said, the broadcast networks have been kind of carrying this <sighs> – Every once in a while, yeah. on landing day, the, most of the networks didn't cut away to see it. But on the internet, it was seen and there was just an incredible intensity huge. to it. Yeah. And people are really, really want to learn about it. And I think that's great. I mean, I think it's really great Do to you, see. Well, for instance, one of the things that would capture, capture CNN's uh, attention is uh, proof of life, proof of water. Do you, do you prioritize those experiments because you know that they'll be uh, of great interest <laughs> Or do, um, or, or do scientists say, no, no, we're going to do the hard science. We're going to do what we need to do. I think the scientists largely go off with their scientific goals to do the things that they want to do for science. Right. And other folks then look at what they're doing and just translate it into the things that people understand. Other people who are non-scientists understand it. in Got the it. media. Because they do plenty of cool stuff. Right. It's just a matter of telling people about it. 
Um, and then prior to landing, you know, we had um, a bunch of social media folks, people who did Twitter and Facebook actually come into Mission Control and they got to come in uh, just like the regular press got to come in and ask us questions and do that kind of thing. That was great. You did a great job with that. And many of my friends uh, were part of those groups that got to be there, got to be there that night. Uh, and, it, and, it, and it did help a lot because we felt like we were all participating directly in uh, right. that amazing uh, event. So what? any surprises so far in the scientific mission? Um, I was surprised that they picked up the, the evidence that there was water on Mars so quickly. They, I, they announced that they looked at the pebbles on the ground and they could see because they were rounded. They looked like river rocks. Yeah, that we've landed in an ancient riverbed and that there was water flowing and they can tell us how fast it was flowing and how deep it was. It's amazing. Those geologists, they they're this. amazing. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> My dad's um, a no. geologist and that always blows me away because he could totally do that. He'd say, oh, yeah, that well, you see that there, that kid. How do you know that? Well, that's, we know that. That's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, um, yeah. Another interesting thing is when we landed, you know, we had the whole sky crane and we had the rockets up high yeah. um, to keep debris from getting on the rover. But when we took pictures of the top of the rover after we landed, uh, we could see, we could still see like dust and rocks, yeah. things that have been blown up there. So that's a sign that next time we need to make that, that uh, whole bridle a little longer, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I guess 20 feet wasn't enough. We'll have to go for more next time. <laughs> Uh, but you, but you kind of knew because you had the lens ca- caps and you have the I don't, what, you have some weird windshield wiper system, so you're able to clear the lenses off. And yeah, the, the lens cap is like is transparent, so we just falls we off, just blow, blow off the lens yeah, cap, and then yeah. it, and we can see clearly again. So they had planned for it, but I still think they got more than they expected. There's always surprises. The pictures are mind boggling. I mean, the pictures are incredible. In fact, they're too good. They look like we're in Tucson. I mean, it's like people <laughs> say, I, "This looks like Earth," and you know, in the middle of the Arizona or somewhere. Yeah, it it's is, real. <laughs> it's real. It's amazing to sit in the mission control center at two o'clock in the morning and get a new set of pictures down from Mars and yeah. look at it. Oh, well, we're the first people on Earth yeah. to ever see these yeah. pictures, and they're beautiful. Well, even during the landing, when we got the first images, the first thumbnails uh, came over. It was, it was. Uh, I get chills still thinking about it. It was just so exciting. Absolutely. And that was when I was really waiting for that moment because even though we got the data saying we'd landed well, I really wanted to see those pictures that showed we were flat on the ground, the wheels were on the ground, we weren't turned sideways or something bizarre like that. And, and it, I was so happy to see those pictures. It, it really, it, 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 I think, it, correct me if I'm wrong, it couldn't have gone better. It's hard to see how it could have gone better. It really just went wonderfully. I certainly wouldn't complain. I would do it all over again. <laughs> Just the neatest thing in the world. And, you know, we want to see more uh, of this kind of thing. Now, I think one of the reasons that perhaps the mainstream media wasn't so captivated by this, and I, and I was thinking this on Sunday when I was uh, watching Felix Baumgartner basically fall out of a weather balloon. And there was, a, you know, 8 million people watched it. And, you know, there was, there was this gloss of science around it. But basically, it, it, it's a stunt. And, um, and, I, and there was so much attention. And I was thinking, why... This, and then I realized why, because there's a human. And even though from a purely scientific point of view, it makes absolute sense. It's crazy to send people to Mars. It makes it so much easier. Even the moon, unmanned missions just make a lot more sense. But they don't, they don't grab you in the same way. Yeah, I think one of the lessons, one of the lessons I've learned from this, because I'm an engineer, Okay, I think just landing the rover yeah. in and of itself is really, really it's cool. awesome. <laughs> yeah. It's awesome. But nobody's um, life was at stake, I guess. That's what. And if you look at the people, what happened afterwards in the press, um, you know, the types, people really want that human element in the story. So the types of people that the press latched onto, um, there was the guy with the mohawk, Bob Eck. <laughs> mohawk guy, yeah. It's the guy who used to play rock music, <laughs> right. right, Adam. Um, when news came out that my family was doing this Mars time thing, it was that's us. The, they needed the that story. human element. Right to grab onto. And I, I think that's something, that's a lesson I'm going to take with me as I contemplate what we, what right. we should do next in the space program. We're humans. It's not just about the robots. We're humans. Yeah. And um, um, while you can get so much information, if you really want to care about something, a human uh, has to be involved. That's true in sports. It's true in everything. Yeah. Uh, unf- unf- unfortunately or unfortunately, it's just how we're made. It's just the way, that, the way that it is. So let's talk about the human interest story. So all the scientists at JPL 
on this program are living on Mars time. What is Mars time? Well, as I mentioned much earlier, when we operate on Mars, we have to operate on rover time because the rover uh, looks back at Earth every morning at 10 a.m. Mars time and says, tell me what to do today. And we have to operate so that we always have orders ready for the rover. A Martian day, which is called a sol, a uh, Martian day is 40 minutes longer than an Earth day. So one day on Earth, 24 hours. One day on Mars, 24 hours and 40 minutes. Oh, it's, just, it's not a big difference. But over time, that <laughs> means that every day we go in 40 minutes later to work. Right. Every single day. So you do? Um, more or less, yeah, we do. Wow. And so it's the equivalent of you're jumping a time zone a day and you kind of work your way all the way around the clock over the course of 36 days. <sighs> And so by working on Mars time, you're really just continually changing the time of day that you go to sleep, that you eat, that you do all of those things to follow the time on Mars. I guess you have to. Yeah, you really do have to. Otherwise, you're getting up in the middle of the night. So this way, it's always, you know. But what's interesting is that you also got your family to do it. Uh, Your wife, your 13-year-old son, your 10-year-old daughter, and your 8-year-old daughter all lived on Mars time. That's right, my eight-year-old son. And son, that, uh, Devin, I'm sorry. Yeah, and that was really my wife's brainchild um, because I had to go do this crazy schedule. But in August, the kids weren't in school, and if I was going to see them at all, uh, we were going to have to do something with the family. Well, that's a so good we idea. Took the whole family onto Mars time. Yeah. Not and, once school started, they went back on on, on uh, Earth time. Yeah, they did. Okay. They did go yeah. back on Earth time. Because, but in the meantime, disruptive. in August, you know, they stayed up all night and did all that stuff with me. Yeah. Wow, that's kind of neat. And how did they like it? I know your son has a blog on it. Um, they loved it because they got to see a whole bunch of stuff they had never seen before. Right. Um, they got to see Hollywood at midnight and see all the people there. Uh, they got to go to all-night diners. <laughs> we did a picnic out in Santa Monica Beach at midnight. And uh, we went down into downtown L.A. at 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, they, were, they had a great time, and they've come back and asked me, when do we get to do it again? <laughs> I have to tell them, I don't know if you ever get to do it again. That's a, you don't get to do that very often. That's a once-in-a-lifetime thing. You could always do it, but it wouldn't be for any reason. You'd just be doing it. <laughs> and, you know, it's actually really hard to do because you've got you've yeah. to line your, your, uh, your work life up with it and everything. But really, I think for them it was a big adventure, and that was what we wanted because we wanted them to feel the adventure of exploring Mars Good. And, and to get a chance to participate in that. And to them, getting to stay up all night and live around the clock in L.A. was a big adventure for them. They got to see all sorts of things they'd never seen before, and I think they had a great time. They really had a great time with it. And my wife did, too. You know, we joke about missing it every once in a while, how great it was to get to do it. So you're not going to do another Mars mission? Um, uh, you mean me personally? Yeah. Or? I mean, it, maybe you will get to do it again. <laughs> maybe. Um, we're talking about there's a Mars mission coming up in 2016 uh, for the 2016 launch opportunity called InSight, and that one's being done by JPL. And then they're t- we're talking about what to do in Mars 2018 and Mars 2020, whether we should start a Mars sample return, bringing things back from Mars or send orbiters or whatnot. So, yeah, there'll be other missions for me to work on, I think, over time. Or I hope so. It all depends on the election and the right. budget and all of that stuff that we right. have to worry about in the government. I do remember that briefly we were going to go to Mars. We were put a, a landing, manned landing on Mars. Is that is that at all in the future, do you think? I don't think, you know, that would take a lot of money. It's hard. And it, and it's also very hard. And I That's don't a long see flight. That's an eight and a half month flight. I, I don't see, I don't see gov- the government or NASA committing that kind of money to yeah. do that kind of thing right now. And would we gain anything from it besides the, you know, the glory of it? Is there scientifically any reason to send a person? Well, I'm sure we'd gain something scientifically from it. Whether we would gain more than we would have gained from sending robots, I, I don't know. All the gain, though, is in having the person go. I mean, because, you know, if you get to go, you get to be, uh, you get to have your name remembered 500 years ago and from now along with right. Chris Columbus and Charles Lindbergh right. and Neil Armstrong, right? right. That's, yeah, no, that's I'd, li- I'd do it. I'm volunteering. <laughs> I, I know I'm too old and fat, but I'm volunteering. I would do it in a heartbeat. You wouldn't have you, to, and I bet you it. that there's, there's millions of people. Who would say the same thing? How yeah. about how about private space? 
I think private space is showing a lot of promise these days, particularly uh, for launch vehicles like SpaceX. Yeah. They had a successful launch, mostly successful launch uh, the, over the past week. And one of the key problems with space travel is just that it's expensive to get to orbit. And NASA and JPL, we're really good at doing things first, but we are not the low bidder. And I don't think we ever will be. So it is great to see some of the hard work of getting to orbit go out into commercial industry where they're a lot more cost focused and they can uh, do things differently and do things cheaper. And if they really can, if SpaceX can accomplish its goals, its stated goals of trying to lower the cost of getting to space by a factor of five or ten, that'll revolutionize everything to do with space travel. Um, human, robotic, satellites that we watch television on, all of that stuff could be revolutionized by that. Sure. I guess a space elevator would be, is one of the ways you could make it cheaper to get out. The, what, so that's the most expensive thing is getting out of, getting into orbit, getting out of the Earth's gravitational field. Yeah, that's still the most expensive thing. The reason we don't make anything in space is because the cost of taking, say, a pound of sand to space if you could take a pound of sand to space and convert it to gold and bring it back and then sell it, you'd still lose money because it costs yeah. you so much to get the sand up to space to begin with. But I so. hear there's a big diamond out there. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are people talking about trying to bring asteroids from deep in space back right. to the Earth and get minerals and stuff all, off of that too. Um, that's, that's an adventure. Um, and I don't, I don't know if that really works. We'll find out. There are people who are trying to do it. It's very, it's really, uh, uh, I feel that we need it for our own spirit as much as for the science of it, that it, it is so important for the human spirit to explore beyond our planet. I think that's really true. And I also think even in very practical terms, people use space all the time and they take it for granted now. So if you watch Satellite TV, if you watch Direct TV or right. Dish Network, if you listen to a weather report, if you use a GPS, if you try to find your location on your iPhone, if you watch cable television, all of that, CNN and ESPN are all distributed by satellite. Um, satel space has actually literally revolutionized the world that we live in. And it's so common now that we take it for granted. Most people use space every single day and they don't even realize it. Every time you open up your cell phone and you're looking for where the nearest hamburger joint is, you're using GPS satellites. So it's really changed our lives in very practical ways, as well as giving that great sense of adventure and exploration that helps drive the society forward. So there are people watching right now who are – there are a lot of young people watching, kids who are thinking about what to study in college. There's people who are interested in this – what would you, how would you encourage them to get involved? What should people be doing? Um, I encourage everybody who has even a little bit of interest in math and science to go off and pursue it because yes. using math and science, you can change the world. You can change the world in space travel. You can change the world in Facebook. You can do whatever. Um, and I hope that the space program inspires people to go off and do that. For folks who are older who are in college and are looking at what to what to major in my advice and i actually think this is very practical advice is if you have any interest in technical things math and science take the most technical degree you can get really because, well because if you get a, a physics degree you can always decide later hey i'm going to be an engineer or i'm going to be a lawyer or a doctor or an entrepreneur or i'm going to work on wall street or i'm going to work in television or i'm going to work in podcasting um <laughs> it's, it's going much... straight down by the way david i swear. that was not <laughs> started out there and then and now and po or podcasting <laughs> but if you start in college with something that's non-technical and you ever decide later hey i want to go back and be an engineer it's much harder to, just, to switch back. You can't go. Um, here. I got to tell my son this because, you know, it's interesting. He's like you. He's very interested in, in music and music composition and logic and stuff. But he's suddenly gotten excited by physics. And um, I so I got to say that. Do the physics first. You can do the music, but do the physics because you can always do the music later. You can, you can get the engineering degree when yeah. you're in college. It's, it, opens, it opens a million possibilities now. Yeah, it's, that's really true. And you can always decide later you want to do music. And I promise you, if you decide you want to do music, you will not regret getting the engineering degree. Yeah. You really won't. I was um, so thrilled. He came to me the other day and said, did you know the GPS 
uses relativity is it is it is a, is a applied example of the Einsteinian theory of relativity? I said, "Is it? Tell me all about it." And it was really exciting for me to hear that coming out of out of his mouth. That was really really cool. That's great. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, David, you've done probably one of the coolest things of the year: landing a Volkswagen size Explorer and Space Lab on the surface of a planet eight and a half months away via spaceship. That's straight. Did you ever think as a kid you'd be doing that? Uh, you know, I think I think working working on the Mars rover has been on my bucket list ever since I came out of college. So check I can check that one off now. Check what <laughs> what do you think's next on that bucket list? Uh, I don't know. I'm working on on ultralight solar rays for for big human missions now, and I would always like to go back and work on another Mars mission or another deep space mission. I think I want to do more rocket science again. I think we want to work on more plasma thrusters. Yeah. That has a kind of cool ring to it too. Yeah. Go back, and go back and do a little bit more of that too. We need that warp drive. Definitely I'll put that on the list. <laughs> put that on the list, would you? What do you mean the solar – like solar for, uh, for uh, power in space for manned missions? Yeah, so so actually the company I'm at right now is trying to build solar arrays that are four times lighter than the solar arrays we have now. Oh, wow. And once they get that light, you can actually start using solar arrays plus plasma thrusters to move people around the solar system. And so they can take to take people to go visit asteroids using Very plasma. slowly. Very slowly, um, but much more efficiently than if you try and do it using normal rockets. So well, you don't have to... Slow is a good thing because all that, you know, that all the, the G forces, that's not good for you. <laughs> the, you know, you can take your time when you're going to visit an take asteroid or something like that, too. It's a little it's different. It's not going anywhere. You know where it's going to be next month, the month after. And the... All right. So the, I'm going to give the chat room a chance to ask David O some questions. A few more minutes, David, if you don't mind. First, I want to tell everybody about Ford and their, and talk about technology. You would think, you know, a hundred year old car company. What could they possibly have to say about technology? Let me tell you. Today's Ford vehicle is a massive technology, including an applied example of Einsteinian relativity, also known as your Ford Sync. It it can tell you where you are, where you're going, give you turn-by-turn directions, and at the same time as it's doing that, it can command your music player to play your favorite song or artist or Tell, you can even say to the Ford Sync, it's all voice activated. And the idea of that is for safety. You keep your eye on the road and your hands on the wheel, of course. But you could say, play more like that. I like that song. And it will do that. If you're listening to the HD radio with, on, on a, a Ford Sync with available My Ford Touch, you could say, tag that. I want to buy that when I get home. I like that song. And the iTunes tagging will do that. I just tried it with my iPhone 5. The lightning cable works great because all Ford Sync vehicles have at least one, sometimes two USB ports, charging ports. They even charge when the car is turned off. But they also allow you to control the iPhone 5 with your voice. It works perfectly. I wasn't sure with the new lightning connector. It does, I could say. Uh, I tried it my 2010 uh, Mustang, and it works fantastically. Ford is really a leader in this. They see the car as a platform. They realize that you're going to have that car for years, but you're going to have a new cell phone every one, every couple of years. You know, there's new apps coming all the time. So they've made an API. They call it AppLink into Sync so that the apps can work with Sync. They've given you voice control. You even get voice control of your cell phone through this API. It really is. Uh, it's, it's really a great example of engineering uh, done right. I want you to see more at Ford.com slash technology. Or go to your Ford dealer and drive one. Say, I'm, I'm here to test drive the sink. I'll, I'll do a car and the sink, okay? Ford.com slash technology. Go further in a Ford. And we thank them for their support of triangulation. All right. Chat room. Uh, Nerve asks, what types of mission uh, missions uh, can Curiosity perform? What is the agenda? For, what, is, what is Curiosity designed to do? What Curiosity is designed to do as a science mission is to look at Mars and try and figure out whether Mars ever could have supported life or might be able to support life today using its scientific instruments. So it has these laboratories on board that can look for organic chemicals, which are one of the signs that it might have been able to support life. It has a weather station on board. It has these lasers which can look at the composition of rocks as well as the cameras. So that's his main mission. It's scientific. To see if Mars was ever habitable is what the scientists call it. That, I mean, that's a great one. And why is it that we want to know that? 
Um, I think the one of the big questions is still whether Mars ever supported life. Right. And this is all related, again, to having found evidence that there was water on Mars. Um, figuring out where the water went is one thing. But everywhere on Earth that we have water, no matter how cold it is, no matter how deep it is, no matter how dark it is, we have found life. And the natural question is, hey, on Mars, if there was water, does that mean there was life there before? Right. And this is another step in answering that question. If there were life, is there, are there things on Curiosity that it could detect it? If there were microbes alive now on Mars, could Curiosity detect that? The scientists have been very, uh, very careful to say that they don't guarantee that, that Curiosity can find life. Actually finding life is very difficult. And I think that was one of the things we learned from Viking. You have to make certain assumptions about what the life is doing and how to find it to make – to, to be sure that you found it. But it can find all of the signs of it, and maybe if we, get, if we got lucky, we could find life if it's there. Um, it's kind of like the Higgs boson. It's easier to see the outcome of it than the actual boson itself. I think that's a good way of putting it, yeah. yeah. We can see, we can see the, the signs that life was there easier than we can actually find the life itself. The, the byproducts, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, that was uh, Curtis B's uh, question. Kerfuffle says, as I'm an engineering student... I would love to intern at JPL or NASA. What is it? What is it that they're looking for? What kinds of things should I be doing to uh, improve my chance of such a such a job? Uh, I think we take a lot of interns at NASA. We also get a lot of people who apply. Uh, you should be a top engineering student. Do very well in your classes. Um, if you happen to go to a top school, that helps. There are certain schools that we uh, that we reach out to all the time. Uh, if you don't, I think it really helps when you put your resume in to have some strong recommendation letters from people, professors, pe better people that you worked with who can say, yeah, this is a kid that you should really consider um, looking at. Because we get a lot of great people who apply, and we like to see those types of things. We like to see the excitement and the, and the evidence that, hey, you know how to do some hard work. And that is a plum gig, boy, if you can get it. <laughs> How long is Curiosity uh, design? I know, I know the, these these rovers, uh, Spirit and Oppor was it Spirit and Opportunity lasted so much longer than they were expected to last. How long is Curiosity designed to last for? Uh, Curiosity is designed to last at least two Earth years, which is one Martian year. Um, but I think we hope that it will last much longer. We, you know, I hope that it's lasting long enough that my kids could graduate from college and go drive it around someday. Oh, wouldn't that be cool? Uh, you know. <laughs> yeah. That would be awesome. Yeah. Uh, and when you drive and it, the, what do you do? You don't, there's no joystick. You go left, right, up, down. No. In, in fact, the rover's pretty smart. You can, um, it has intelligent software on board so that you can eventually tell it, go over there. Go there, yeah. And it will look at the rocks around it and stuff and figure out what's around it and then figure out the easiest way to get there by itself. And if it gets into trouble, it will stop and it will call back to Earth and say, hey, help me. That, so it's got all sorts of smarts built into it. We've really gotten, I mean, even if we're as slow a processor as it is compared to, say, here, as you did compared to your iPhone or modern computers, this, these are still much better computers than they were 10 years ago or 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, and, and it really is conceivable to have an autonomous vehicle at this point. Uh, yeah, the vehicle, the vehicle has really a lot of smarts built into it yeah. and um you know there's a lot of stuff we do on our iphone that's kind of wasteful of the processing yeah. power too <laughs> you can only play so much angry birds on that one gear <laughs> processor there. we point. don't we don't have that running on yeah, the that's a very good point is it uh, how is it powered is it plutonium uh, is it nuclear or is it uh, batteries solar it is powered by plutonium. There's what's called a plutonium radioisotope thermal generator. So we take the heat generated by the plutonium and we turn it into electricity. We do store it in a battery. So it kind of charges up this battery overnight and then we wake up in the morning ah. and we drive the battery down and then we go to sleep and it charges the battery back up. But that plutonium power source will last for decades. Yeah. It could keep going for a long time. Yeah. What would be the thing that would give out then? Why two years? You could go, you should be able to go a long time. Oh, we should be able to go longer than two years. Is there are moving parts. Eventually, they motors wear out, wear out and yeah. things happen. The, the spirit you know, lost a wheel at one point. And opportunity is still going around on the surface of Mars, though. I know. It's um, so cool. Yeah. It won't give yeah. up. 
just keeps on going. Now, we humans, we mere lay people, we personify these things. We anthropomorphize. I mean, they really feel like and it doesn't hurt that it's got a Twitter account. Do you, as scientists, do you kind of start to feel about curiosity like she's a thing, a person or something? Absolutely. I think it's a she, personally. She. Yeah. I, I don't call it a he. Um, I've, I've heard engineers, they, uh, they refer to the different part of the parts of the flight software by, by the gender of the person who wrote it. So she did this and he did this. And oh, that's neat. The, the, the rover starts getting multiple personalities sometimes. <laughs> but it really, you talk about it, you, you can think of it like a person. It goes to sleep at night, wakes up during the day, it goes off to do its thing, calls back home, says, what should I do? It really is kind of like a person like that. That's really neat. What's the range uh, that it can go in a day? Um, we've been driving it uh, maybe 50, me, uh, 50, 60 feet, I think. Okay. Um, but eventually we hope it can go 100 yards in a day. That's when we have all the smarts on board, when we're sure all the smarts on board are working. So we have all this intelligent software, but just like the landing, we can't test it on Mars until we get to Mars. Right. So we're taking time making sure that yeah. everything works before we let it, let it give it the car keys and let it go off on its own. And eventually you want to get to that mountain in the distance? Is that the goal? That's right. We want to get to this big mountain called Mount Sharp, which is way off in the distance in the middle of the crater. Because when we look at it, we can see that it has layers in it. Like the Grand Canyon has layers, or when you go into the deserts in Arizona, you can see layers of rock that trace back the history of Mars as you go through the different layers. So by studying the layers, we'll be able to study uh, what happened in the past on Mars and, uh, and sort of go through its whole history. Wow. Any other questions uh, for, uh, by the way, Cool Breeze says, during the landing, Curiosity's tweets were hysterical. <laughs> and they were. It was... <laughs> And that helps to the personification of it as well, because you really feel like she, we're, ta we're, we're, we're hearing from her. Right. And it was the same with the uh, opportunity, too. It was just, it's so cool. Uh, I think that's uh, how, okay, Curtis B says, uh, you mentioned that earlier that the orbiter only talks to Curiosity once a day. How many times uh, does the satellite, uh, the orbiter orbit in a day? Is it, is it? because it's not positioned properly in other orbits that it doesn't get to talk to it enough? So I, I simplified a little for the example there. E, there are actually two orbiters in orbit around Mars that talk to the spacecraft, that talk to the rover every day, and each one gets two passes over the vehicle. So we get oh, okay. four chances to talk to the vehicle. But when you sum up all of the data that we get over all four passes, Got it. we still get about only 50 megabytes a day on average. Um, it just... It's, it's really hard to get data to come 150 million miles. You, well, I, two megabits stuns me. That seems like an – that's great. <laughs> that's from the rover to the orbiter right above it. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, and then it, you know, we have to get it from the orbiter back here to on Earth. But it could, could transmit almost continuously probably. Back to uh, yes, but yeah. not at two megabits but per second. a much slower rate, yeah. I'm just saying right. I, my DSL will only go two kilometers, so that's pretty, pretty darn good. Um, That's right. <laughs> uh, do you think uh, you will, Terry K says, do you think you will use the sky crane method again? I think there's fair odds we will. Having gotten it to work once, there's no need to go reinvent the wheel. Yeah. Uh, but we're really, the Mars program is in a, a period of re of being redone because we had ideas on what we wanted to do with it. And in the end, it turned out it, there was no money to do what they wanted yeah. to do with it. So they're trying to scale it down and find cheaper ways of doing things. So we'll have to see what comes out. I don't think we know exactly what the Mars program will look like going forward. Um, and a lot of it really depends on what happens in the election and what happens in the budget cycle and, and things like that. You know, the annual budget for NASA is so tiny compared to the federal budget. And this stuff is so... Uh, important. Uh, just write your member of Congress. Now's a good time because they're up for election. You know, they might listen to you <laughs> and say, you know, it's one. Go ahead. It's uh, the money spent on NASA is one half of one percent of the federal budget. It's one half penny on every dollar spent yeah. by the federal government. And, and it's just a tiny, tiny fraction. We get so much out of it in in terms of science but also in terms of excitement and, and the human, and, you know, just celebration of the human spirit. 
Um, are there now Mars is our, is the is the easiest planet that we can get to? Um, are are we contemplating Mercury or Jupiter or somewhere else, or is is this like pretty much it? Well, there's a spacecraft on the way to Pluto. There's a spacecraft on it's the way to Jupiter. Fly by. No landing. Right. Yeah. There's no landing on Pluto. Oh, you're asking where are we contemplating landing? Yeah. Oh, that's a different question. There are people who are who are contemplating landing on Venus, which is a very difficult target, um, trying to get down there. Uh, there are uh, people who want to take a good close look at Europa, which is a moon of Jupiter. I think a landing may be a little bit too adventurous for now, but for now they, they definitely want to get in close and take a good look at it. Um, and there are people who are talking about trying to land on asteroids. There's a mission they're working on which is going to try and go to an asteroid and collect a sample and bring it back to Earth so we can look at it. And yeah. that's, not, that's not something which is a decade off. That's something that's just a couple of years off of um, being built by our friends out in Maryland at Goddard Space Flight Center. Well, the and, there, and, and there's a f potential financial uh, value to landing on asteroids and harvesting asteroids that might stimulate There's that. a private company that is that has started up for the purpose yeah. of trying to harvest asteroids or look at harvesting asteroids yeah. for, their, for the economic benefit. David, you've been very generous of your time. I thank you so much for being here. And thank you for the work you've done and the inspiration that you've given us all. It's just very exciting. Thank you very much, Leo. I had a great time. David O., Lead Flight Director, Mars Science Lab, Curiosity. Thank you, David. Take care. Thank you. And thank you for being here on Triangulation. I just I love this show. You never know who we're going to meet. Actually, I do kind of know who we're going to meet coming up in future episodes. Next week, the man who started Friendster, Jonathan Abrams. He's a serial entrepreneur, and his latest nuzzle is really a great way to keep up on news. It's personalized news feeds from Twitter. That's going to be fantastic. Um, Tom and Sarah are, and I, as each, are going to get to do their own version of triangulation in November when I'm off on vacation. Uh, I know Penny Arcade is the topic of uh, Tom's show. I'm not sure about the rest. And for our Halloween edition, <laughs> Richard Cadry, Kill the Dead, will join us on triangulation. I'll have to do that one in costume, I believe. Stay tuned. Inside Twit is next. Thank you, David. Really great. I appreciate it. Thank you. It. It's, you know, it's just morning. It's still just morning Mars time, so your day has just begun. <laughs> Think of it that way. That's right. <laughs> That's right. right. I did notice in, on uh, Twitter today there is some question over, I mean, we call yesterday, yestersol, I'm sorry, the, day, the soul yester before, sol. the current soul was yestersol. I love that. But... What are we going to call the Sol after Solaro. the Sol? <laughs> Nexter Sol. <laughs> I like Nexter Sol. I like that. <laughs> uh, I think my family was using Tomorrow Sol for a while, but Solmaro Sol Sol has a certain ring to it. Uh, Nexter Sol. I vote for Nexter Sol. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye. You have a, you have a good day. All bye. right, you too. Thanks. We do a triangulation every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern Time, 2200 UTC. Please tune and watch live because, frankly, I need your questions. It's really great. I love this part of the show where we can give you a chance to ask questions. We have such great guests. I'm going to need your help with Richard Kadri, so I want you to tune in for Halloween at least. Um, and uh, if you can't watch live, of course, you can always watch on demand after the fact. We make audio and video versions available at twit.tv slash tr. I, uh, if you want to uh, watch previous episodes or just download them and keep them forever as a little keepsake, a little memento. I thank Karsten Bondi, our producer. He's booking such great guests. Karsten, nice job. Uh, and uh, I hope we'll see you next time on Triangulation. Triangulation.